Okay, there. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, kind of run a little bit late. Um, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I uh, hope everybody's keeping warm and doing okay today. Um, yeah, uh, I know I've said this before, but tonight might be a bit uh, short. Um, um, it's not a whole lot to go over, but uh, but I've also got something I really got to get out here, unfortunately, and didn't quite get it taken care of yet. So, um, all right. Yeah, let me know if there's any questions. I'm still trying to work on uh, maybe getting some kind of some other assignments besides the quizzes, but uh, we have our usual, the the quiz over the uh, chapter for this week. Um, and I, I, I probably should note, or I'm going to have to start making a note of this, that, um, that yeah, the, I just realized the, the week before that um, um, there is some extra chapters, uh, some differences from the 11th edition. I think the 10th and the 9th edition have the same chapters, although I don't have the ninth edition. Um, so if somebody actually has a ninth edition, let me know if there's differences between the tenth and the ninth. Uh, but but yeah, so that kind of means though that uh, yeah, if you have the newest eleventh edition, um, it's called chapter six because uh, four and five were split apparently between the tenth and eleventh edition. We actually covered kind of those two the week before. So. Um, okay, um, so yeah, I mean, my, 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 um, okay, well, somebody's got an eighth edition, that's, that's fine, yeah, but, uh, just let me know if, um, if, um, if you do start seeing differences, if you have an eighth or a ninth edition, um, and I'll uh, try to keep track of those. So. Okay, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm looking, you should be doing the chapter about internal memory this week, uh, whichever chapter number it is. So we kind of went through um, really the previous week was kind of, there really were two topics. Um, so it was kind of, the memory hierarchy as a whole was kind of the first part, and then uh, talking about cache memory uh, specifically. So this week we're moving down the memory hierarchy, uh, well, a bit. So we're looking at internal memory. Um, so, um, I mean, well, really this chapter is kind of about the technologies of uh, for internal memory. So semi semiconductor based memory. You know, basically, so things without mechanical parts are, are what are usually used at this level, the memory hierarchy. And, and we got into this a little bit um, um, last week as well when we talked about cache, but um, there's a lot more information about the um, actual technology of the cache and the main memory uh, this week, um, if you've done your readings. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, um, just kind of as an aside, uh, all this kind of stuff is good to know, you know, so it's not the kind of stuff that I really think people need to memorize, um, but um, but kind of understanding the basics of sort of the technology um, and the trade-offs between them can really be helpful in understanding, you know, the, the layout and the, the, the current um, way and design and configuration of computing systems. Um, oh, and by the way, I kind of mentioned, I've been kind of posting some uh, just um, um, asides of, about interesting things that I see. If anybody, um, if you see things that pique your interest that are related to kind of the topic that we're talking about in this course, so architecture and um, organization of computing systems, uh, um, um, I'd certainly love to see what other people are, are seeing and but yeah, from our um, kind of talk for our first three weeks, I kind of got into looking at the Apple M1 chip that came out and reading a little bit about its architecture and stuff. So some interesting stuff on there that, uh, like I mentioned, um, uh, from the, the first few weeks here of our class, um, you know, that 
articles like this will probably make a lot more sense to you now that, that you've learned a little bit about the basics of the different kinds of architectures and, and, and some of the trade-offs and things like that. So. Uh, all right. So let's, um, let's look at uh, memory here. Um, so like I said, it's not, it's not all that big of a chapter. Um, so we might only go like maybe an hour today um, at most or so. Um, so we're mostly looking at different semiconductor memory technologies. So these are you know, technologies that are um, uh, not mechanical. So, so it's not um, rotating media. Um, so, I mean, all, all these, again, you know, if, if you want to be an electrical engineer, you'd, you'd of course have to get into much more details, but, um, uh, you know, for kind of the level of, of somebody who's in the technology industry, who's on kind of the software side, just in general understanding, you know, the, the layout of, of things like this. So you can really think of semiconductor memory as, as some kind of, of a cell, that, that holds a bit um, and, and whatever the technology is, whatever the substrate is, there's some way that, that, that you can um, cause a stable state that can be differentiated, can be read out, you know, that, that you can use to interpret as a one or a zero, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, these technologies, all, all the specific ones that we talk about, I mean, you, you have to be able to write to it at least once, right? Um, some, some of these technologies um, like uh, ROM and, and some of the EEPROMs, um, you might only write to when it's manufactured. So you have to actually write the hard code, the data onto it at manufacture time. Some of them allow, allow a limited kind of writing. So they are a little bit programmable, but it, it might be really tough to write or rewrite them. Um, and then of course, on the other end, uh, of course, you have things that are fully writable. So they're you, the readable and writable. Of course, everything has to be readable, right? So, so uh, even if it's only, only writable when you manufacture the thing, it still, it wouldn't be of any use if you couldn't uh, read the data back off of it, right? So, so all these semiconductor memories are readable and, and everything in the, the internal memory hierarchy that's used. Uh, we have to read the data back from it, but some of them are more or less writable than others, you know. Um, and, you know, as, as we talked a little bit about last week in the memory hierarchy, uh, since there's no real perfect one for um, a perfect type of memory, all these things have found uh, niche, niches in the, um, uh, in, in various architectures of, 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 you know, where their cost uh, speed um, and size trade-offs make them useful uh, to, to plug in at, at various portions of a computing hierarchy. So, um, so, so yeah, the, it's kind of back to this. Uh, so the, the various technologies, the way it actually stores the bit, and the way you do the thing to read it out or write in differs for the different types of um, technologies that we kind of list here in this chapter. And, um, you know, th those different technologies end up having different properties, which make them more or less expensive and more or, you know, or faster or slower or capability capable of um, making lots of it at cheap cost or, or not so much of it, so too expensive to make lots of it. Um, so. Um, all right, so yeah, let's move on. So um, really, and, and, and this is true, uh, the kind of the, the technologies were relatively stable until, I don't know, the last five or 10 years. So almost everything was, um, you know, since the the kind of the personal computer era, the Apples and the IBMs and the in the seventies and eighties um, was um, two different types of semiconductor memory being used for 
the internal memory, so be it, and one specifically was mo is mostly still used for the cache, and that's your uh, DRAM, dynamic RAM. Uh, sorry, that's, that's the SRAM, the static RAM. And then um, one um, being mainly used for the, um, uh, the, your main memory, uh, and that was the, the DRAM technology, dynamic RAM, right? Um, and then mostly using uh, electronic rotating medium for the hard drives for the external storage then. So, I mean, that's been kind of the case and it's still mostly the case, although, you know, now if, if you look in your um, phones or like at the Apple M1 chip or, um, um, uh, or your laptops, you're likely to see some other things in there, like, uh, of course, flash drives, but um, solid state drives getting into the equation. And some of these technologies that, that, that are talked about in this chapter are starting to make their way into designs for the cache or the um, um, main memory. Um, so, so I'd assume even before this class, everybody probably you know kind of knows RAM and ROM, right? Uh, RAM, random access memory versus ROM, read-only memory. Um, uh, RAM is commonly understood to be readable and writable. Um, although, you know, uh, these are a little bit of the misnomers, yeah, misuse of the term, because both of these RAM and ROM um, are, uh, they're, they're, they're random access. So the, the, by that, we mean that um, to read or write uh, a, a byte to any particular address on the, the memory is, is about the same amount of time usually, you know, so relatively equal. So they're both random access. They're not like serial devices, like a, like a tape or semi-serial, like, like some sort of rotating uh, medium that you have to wait for it to come around before you can read or write. So, um, but RAM is, is often commonly understood to be um, readable and writable. Um, so, I mean, it is, and ROM is, is understood to be not writable or, or not easily, depending on the technology. Uh, another thing is, is RAM is typically volatile, um, both, both cache and uh, main memory that we use, all right? So, uh, that, and that's kind of, you know, that's, um, that's not really a useful property. If all things considered, we'd rather have memory being um, non-volatile so that the data is always there, even if the power goes off, right? But, um, you know, up until recently with, with solid state drives and things, um, it, it was, um, you know, there was no technology that was really fast enough to work as primary memory, uh, except for uh, SRAM and DRAM technology, basically. And, and, and both of these are basically, well, so that's not true. So, um, um, so we can use these for non-volatile cases as well. Um, but, but in that case, for the ROM things, technologies that we talk about in a little bit here, um, you kind of have to trade off. So, so, so you can make them a bit writable, either not writable at all after manufacturing or kind of writable, but um, um, uh, with difficulty. So, uh, so, so you, you get the non-volatility, but um, uh, they're not really, you know, that you can just use as a general purpose memory. You can only write them once or a limited number of times. So, um, so anyway, let, let's. Um, um, it probably is a good idea to understand, you know, the difference between the DRAM and the and the SRAM. Um, uh, dynamic RAM comes from uh, basically it, dynamic RAM is, is simpler. Um, you know, it, it's just um, uh, like a, a single capacitor um, that the, and, and the charge in the capacitor stores the bit, uh, but because it's a capacitor, um, I mean, it, it tends to lose that charge. So it has to be dynamically refreshed, which is where the dynamic comes from. Um, so yeah, it requires kind of a periodic uh, charge refreshing. So, um, uh, 
whereas like the static RAM, um, it uses something that looks more like a like a flip flop, like a, a, a logic gate. Um, so once you flip it one way or the other to represent your bit, um, it's, it's stable. Uh, again, though, it's stable as long as you have uh, current. Um, so um, uh, for most kinds of static RAM, um, the, the, the flip flop states will go back to some, you know, to one of one or the other um, uh, after some time after you take away power from them. So, um, so yeah, they're both volatile. Um, so because kind of DRAM is is simpler, the dynamic one um, in terms of you know it's really kind of just a capacitor with the the circuits to do the read and the update. Um, and then, of course, the, the logic to refresh the bit as well. Um, so, I mean, because it's simpler, I mean, that allows it to be denser. Um, so you can make more dense memories and so you can make bigger ones at less of an expense, right? So, so this is where, the, if you've ever wondered, you know, why you can't just make everything uh, like cash, the same speed of cash, is kind of the differences are coming mostly from the, the difference between uh, DRAM and SRAM. So, um, so, so, um, so static RAM um, is um, a little bit more complex. So it's more expensive to make as much of it or to get it as dense. So uh, that, that falls out to then that, um, um, that static RAM is, is somewhat faster. Um, so so uh, SRAM tends to be used for cache memory. So, and nowadays that tends to be then what's used um, on your actual processor um, semiconductor chip. So all, all the cache that's on chip uh, for the processor cores um, is kind of this SRAM um, from my understanding. Um, and uh, then dynamic RAM is tends to be used for main memory. So, so your um, uh, uh, main system RAM, um, memory, uh, but we often just call RAM. Um, so the, the memory external to the processor in, in the memory hierarchy, but still the internal memory, but, but the, the stuff that's not built into the um, processor chip as cache. Um, Um, all right, and yeah, like I said, I mean, for quite a while, this is kind of these two types uh, in order to build cache and um, uh, main memory and along with hard drives has been kind of really the dominant um, pieces of, um, of the memory hierarchy, the, the, the technology used to construct uh, all the pieces of, of, of a typical computing system memory hierarchy. Okay? So part of the reason, I mean, you know, the, for the same reason that processor uh, chips and speeds have been increasing exponentially um, uh, because of the fabrication, fab fabrication technologies. Uh, I mean, that same thing applies to SRAM and DRAM. So, you know, while the kind of the underlying technology uh, uh, hasn't changed in terms of, you know, using a flip-flop for the, the static or the just a more basic construct for the dynamic. Um, the chip fabrication has allowed it to get smaller. So, so you can, you, you can uh, get similar increases to capacity for static RAM and dynamic RAM that you, that you use in computing systems. So. Um, okay, yeah, let's move on. So, um, um, and then there's other kinds of memory, uh, ROMs, read-only memories, or kind of read-mostly memories like uh, programmable ROMs and erasable programmable ROMs and electrically erasable programmable read-only models. Um, and then flash memory um, is a slightly different technology that uh, we, we talked a little bit about later here, uh, more, more recent. Um, so um, yeah, I won't go into the kind of as much of the details on the technology on these. Um, that they, they are used in computer systems for more specialized purposes. So like your boot 
uh, bootloader code might be burned onto a, a ROM. Um, and, and that's a fixed part of getting your computing system up, you know, whereas one part of that might be to, to load, um, uh, you know, from, you know, to expect some sort of a hard drive, some sort of a permanent storage device that it can access in some particular way and to load the first, you know, the, 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 the master, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, usually the first uh, sector on the drive into a particular place in memory uh, that the, the CPU can start executing at and that can that can bootstrap up your process to then begin loading the other parts of the operating system and things. So, um, um, and then, you know, in, in other kinds of areas, so, so not, not normally for general purpose computers, you have uh, EE proms, things like that. These are more for hobbyists, kinds of things or um, for microcontrollers and things where you might want to have something that's kind of ROM-like, but um, you might want to be able to, to re-program uh, it. So, so yeah, the, the EEPROM, I, I guess, was, you know, you had to actually do a, a spe you know, you had to um, erase it with exposure through ultraviolet radiation. So that was how you actually erased it before making it ready to rewrite some new data onto it. And then so the newer EE proms allowed for, um, instead of having to expose it to ultraviolet radiation, to be able to actually erase with an electrical signal. So you can do it all kind of from software instead of having to have special hardware, or not all, but, but, but more easily from kind of regular um, hardware that you might have. So then flash memory is kind of like EE prom, but, but a, a different technology, but it's, it's um, electrically erasable. Um, so things like the flash USB drives and things um, are using something that's um, kind of descended from that, so. Um, So yeah, I kind of want. I did want to show a little bit like um, uh, some of this, the chip logic and things. Um, actually, the the chip packages and things maybe a bit. Um, uh, well, um, in general, yeah, I probably shouldn't skip over quite so quick uh, on the chip logic. Uh, hopefully, everybody reads through this at least once. Um, so, um, so for example, um, th there was a little example of, of a typical, uh, Chip logic for a memory semiconductor, like 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 maybe a dynamic RAM. So this would be for the kind of layout that you might see used for um, your regular main memory, right? So dynamic RAM is for your regular main memory. Um, so just kind of interesting. So this was uh, an example of a. Um, um, it really can hold up to four million words, um, um, where actually four million uh, four bit words in the specification here. Although I suppose you could probably uh, expand this so it was four million eight bit words relatively easily. So this array here is supposed to be this, there's supposed to be four copies of this memory array. So for each of the four bit kind of half words um, that you're um, addressing here. So. And the reason you would actually need 22 bits, uh, so you would need a 22 bit address because two to the 22 is, is four meg or four million basically. Um, but um, I mean, if, if you look at this here, the, there's only like 11 address lines um, um, and it discusses this, um, that uh, it, it's some, some kind of time multiplexing goes on. So to, to specify the full 22 bit address, you, you give half of the address um, at, at kind of one time step, and then at the next time step, you give the other half of the, the address. Um, and those um, uh, 
then you know combine to make the the full uh, address uh, that you have. So, um, yeah, and and uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to go into any more detail on that, but um, um, but it's kind of maybe good to relate this to the actual then physical chip packaging. So, so if you look at this, and then kind of look at the um, the the uh, the sixteen megabit RAM. So you can see, I mean, basically, this is the kind of thing that you would plug into a, a socket on a motherboard, right? Um, um, and and then you know you just have pins for all those kinds of control lines that we talked about. So pins for the, all the address lines, um, and then um, so in this case, you would need the eleven pins for your addresses um, um, because we time multiplex so that uh, you present half the address and then at the next time step present the other half and you've got a few other lines and then you got the since it's a four bit kind of a half word um you've got basically four lines in order to read or write in uh the the data zero one two and three for the four bits right um but as as anybody knows i mean if you look at modern um um memory that you would like using a server or something um, and I had a link to that, uh, but you'll normally see things like this. So, so these sort of, um, uh, what are they called? The, uh, the, the DIMMS, uh, modules. Those, those are, uh, oh shoot. Um, DIMM stands for, um, did I write that in my, um, I, th I think the, oh yeah, I remember. So, so SIM has to do with, uh, it's like a single inline memory module and then a DIM, DIM is a double inline memory module. So, so these are the kinds of things that you normally use for your actual um, uh, main memory RAM. Um, um, they'll, they'll look like this. So they're kind of like little um, uh, peripheral boards that you can plug in to peripheral slots. But notice that that there's the four chips on here. The, these four chips, each one of those is one of the um, the DRAM chips, um, although probably bigger. So this is like a 32 megabyte uh, full word. So probably each, so if each one of these is half words, probably each of these is like a 16 megabyte uh, half words. Um, instead of four megabytes, so a 16 megabyte half word. Then we have to combine two of them to get a full byte, um, so, so half bytes. And then since each of those 16, then another one gives the other 16, so for a full 32 megabyte here. So. Um, but yeah, in order to, in order to address, um, 16 megabytes you would need more than 11 lines so you need the uh you need what 16 lines um so you'd have to have like um, um or sorry instead of 22 you'd have to have um 30 32 um so anyway, um, some i had to go back and remember that so um but yeah the the um the sim um, um, so nowadays we, we mostly use the, the 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 dual inline memory module so um, the difference between those if you ever heard that term dim versus sim um, is that originally that these were electrically um, only on one side um, so that was single inline um, and then, so so now the, the dual in line means that actually there's there's two pins on on each side of this plug-in card instead of one. So one on each side, du dual in line, effectively being able to double the number of input pins you can slap this into um, over the the SIMM kind of factor. So anyway. Um, So yeah, I mean that, that's kind of you know um, what the way what most uh, main memory uh, works is, is is similar to what's described here, just just bigger, um, you know. So um, it's um, um, 
of course, much more common to have gigabytes of memory. So, so you'd have you'd have uh, plug-in DIMMs that are you know one gigabyte or four gigabyte or bigger, you know, so uh, to be plugging into your system. So, um, Okay. Um, yeah. So I, th I think that was kind of the, to me, the kind of the most important parts of the uh, um, of this first section on the uh, semiconductor memory here. So, um, so let's see here. Module organization. Um, yeah, I mean, another thing, I mean, it's just a, a general thing. If you ever work with, you know, servers and having to change out their RAM and stuff, um, you, know, you might run across this that, um, you know, often the, um, the dim slots are kind of banked um, in various ways. So, um, Um, and this was for very various reasons for timing and stuff, but uh, but usually the banks can work independently. Um, so the, in, in practice, what it usually comes down to is there'll be certain ways that you need to populate those uh, plug-in uh, DIM modules in order to get the best kind of performance. So um, you might want to, if you have some empty slots, you, you might want to keep your, you usually have to keep your DIMMs in separate banks to start with um, um, if some of your uh, RAM slots are empty so that they're in different interleave memory to kind of increase your performance. So. Um, Okay, yeah, so let's let's go ahead and move on then to error correction. Um, so, you know, something you may or may not have realized, um, the, these semiconductor memories that we're talking about here um, have built-in error correcting uh, circuitry as part of them. Um, so, um, I mean, and, and this is basically because semiconductor memory systems are subject to errors. Um, uh, and there's two kind of main categories of, of errors, either hard failures or soft uh, errors, hard errors or soft errors. So, you know, hard errors are, are things that res are a result of memory defects. Um, um, although, you know, uh, the, like of manufacturing defects. Um, so things that are manufacturing defects, might cause the the you know not to be able to ever use the memory at all, but um, you can have uh, manufacturing defects that don't cause an immediate problem, but uh, through use uh, will cause some or uh, you know some parts of the uh, um, the, the, the semiconductor semiconductor um, logic to fail, you know. Um, so, but yeah, I mean hard errors are repeatable. Right, so uh, if, if you have a, an actual error that um, um, develops um, on your um, your semiconductor memory, um, it will, you know, it, it'll be a, a kind of a permanent thing. So you'll never be able to use those bits of, of memory that um, that. Um, are no longer working, right? Some some chips, uh, you know, so it's kind of common today. I think our textbook mentions this. Um, are so complex that um, it is um, likely that somewhere there'll be um, a, a manufacturing defect or two. So they go through. There's there's a few. There's often some redundant um, like columns or rows in, in in like this layout that we talked about. Um, and then there's kind of a process after manufacturing to test, um, and uh, uh, you might uh, disable some columns that uh, are not working from a manu manufacturing defect, but enable the others and still be able to use the uh, 
the manufactured chip um, after you kind of go through um, that uh, burn in or that uh, initial test kind of process. So, um, but but you know those kinds of things aren't preventable except for through um, through um, um, uh, quality control of your manufacturing process. Um, and then, you know, the, and there are tests, so you, often, you know, your, uh, your uh, boot um, on your computing systems, your, um, your BIOS uh, will have, as part of the boot process, will do automatic memory tests um, uh, on your memory to check them whenever you reboot, to, to try and detect if there's any um, hard errors or not that have developed. So, um, But besides those, I mean, there are soft errors, and um, I don't know if it's if it's fair to it, it's it's still maybe not one hundred percent known how um, how often these kinds of soft errors occur, right? So there, there have been estimates, but but there's still some uncertainty on on you know how common it is that. Um, uh, most people think there's at least two uh, main causes of soft errors. Um, so power supply problems are probably actually the more common of the two, even though people talk about cosmic rays a lot when they talk about these kinds of soft errors, right? But, but um, having kind of noise on your power supply uh, might um, cause bits to be randomly um, uh, flipped um, or, or lost in your semiconductor memory. So, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, at least some soft errors um, are the result of, you know, um, alpha particle bombardment from, from you know, uh, external radiation. So, you know, if they get bombarded just right, it could um, flip a bit or, or do something. So, uh, but, but, but soft errors are, um, are, are temporary, right? So they only happen occasionally. And again, I, I People don't really have a good estimate. Uh, our textbook, uh, again, I think mentioned some of these um, uh, that, that people think that maybe like uh, every six months or so in a typical server, um, you know, there's, there's maybe a, a soft error or two occurring from problems like these on, on average. But I'm sure that varies a lot depending on lots of factors. Um, um, but, you know, even, you know, these are, um, digital computers so even a single bit flip if it happens at, at the wrong place can cause system instability or cause your whole system to crash right um i kind of skipped over um, i meant to mention you know so so all these these um, um technologies are um they're electrical circuits and, and they're analog um so so so, so they're really analog electrical circuits um, down um, um, at their base. So, so th these technologies, um, like how we store a bit and how we flip it and things, digitize uh, the, the, the representation of whatever we're using to represent, you know. So, so you know, if we're using a current level, the level of current um, for a bit, uh, there'll be some sort of a threshold. And, and if at the time of readout, if you're below that threshold, uh, you'll interpret um, as a zero bit. And if you're above that threshold, you'll interpret it as a one bit that's currently stored in your um, memory cell. So, so there is that kind of digitization process that goes on um, in, in this, this chip logic. So. Um, but anyway, I mean, these, Kinds of errors are often enough, uh, you know, occur soft errors occur often enough that um, um, it's been deemed desirable to add a little bit of error correction and error detection circuitry. Okay, so this is all built into the logic of the um, of all these semiconductor memories that we're talking about. We'll have some little bit of, of some error correction and detection. Um, uh, uh, coding in the logic there. So, um, so 
these work in you know similar ways, no matter what kind of code you're using to detect or correct errors. Um, so you know, typically what it what it comes down to is you have to store some extra information. So for every bit or every word of data that you store, you've got a few extra bits uh, that that you can use. Um, uh, to try and detect and possibly correct um, soft errors, you know, so 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 problems uh, that caused a bit to be flipped here or there uh, in your memory. Um, so you know, the, the in the most generic description of that, whenever you write, say, a word of data, so so whatever your word size is, like four bits or eight bits, so, so whenever you write write some. Um, unit of data, a function f will be applied to the word to create the code, um, and then the word and the code are stored together, okay? Um, and then, um, so for error detection, um, so when you come back to read the word back out, if you want to try and detect and then maybe even correct um, an error, um, you would compare, so, so you would redo that kind of that function, and um, and you could compare your um, your your code on the data that you're about to read out to the previous stored code, and um, so so yeah, I mean you know you can end up with three possible results. So no errors detected. Um, so in your error detection, um, the codes matched. So the you, you assume that the fetched data bits are sent out. Okay. So um, um, if you're using an error correcting code, um, then if, if you detect an error, um, either the, the, these codes will tell you that it might be possible to correct the error to the data bits, plus some error correction bits um, are allowed, uh, would allow you to actually you know, um, uh, correct um, the error that you detected and, and continue on. Um, or sometimes it's not possible to correct. So uh, that usually generates some sort of a, a fatal um, system error. So some sort of an interrupt, like a, a, you know, uh, indicating that there was some uh, memory uh, corruption problem. Uh, and, and again, if this was transient, that might just cause your computer to uh, shut down or crash. But if you reboot, um, uh, you might be fine again. You wouldn't see the same um, soft error, same transient error. So. Um, so I didn't. I'm not sure how much detail I want to go to. I mean, um, it would be good if you at least understand this one example of, of, of an error correcting code from our textbook using the Hamming code here. So um, if, if I if, if you haven't heard of the Hamming code and, and I asked you to come up with your own scheme for, uh, I mean, just, just first think of the simplest case, you know, so how would you detect if an error or not occurred? Um, so, I mean, may, maybe your first most, um, straightforward idea would be um, maybe you could just keep a copy of all the bits right so so every time you write a word um, you, you make a copy of all those bits and then when you read out you just compare right um, you, you compare the two copies and if any bits differ then um, it's likely something happened um, that, that that you had a, a soft error um, so one bit somewhere got flipped right um, that, that's not a very good kind of code. Um, for one, you know, you can't really, you can, you can only detect an error, you can't really correct it um, um, because, you know, you couldn't tell from that whether it was, if, if only one bit was different um, at one position, you couldn't tell if it was um, the, the, the bit that got flipped was the original data or the bit that got flipped was your copy of the data, right? So, so you wouldn't really be able to correct with that information. Um, and um, it's definitely bad because that, that effectively doubles your storage, right? So we would like to have a code that um, doesn't, um, uh, you know, because memory is expensive. So every one of these bits that we're talking about for error correction and detection um, um, has to be in a, has to be manufactured onto the semiconductor chip as well. So that adds in uh, more um, 
uh, of the memory cells that we need um, for these error detection and correcting bits here. So. so a very simple thing that you may have heard about is like, like a parity bit um, or like checksums. So uh, kind of a simple idea that, that you can come up with is um, you might always just add a bit um, so that there's an even number of ones, for example. So, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're adding a parity bit uh, for uh, eight bit pieces of data, that would just add a single bit. Um, and, you know, um, every, every time you only had like an odd number of ones, you had one one or three ones or five ones, then your parity bit would be a one so that you have an even number of ones. And um, if you have an even number of ones already, the parity bit would be zero, right? And then again, from that, you can't really tell if, if you check um, when, when you're reading back out the parity bit, you can't really tell um, you can only tell that that um, the parity is incorrect, so there's probably an error, but uh, you can't tell which bit it was that, that that got flipped, so you can't really correct the error, right? Another thing I should have mentioned: most of these error correcting codes that are used assume that there's really only one or maybe two bit at most of an error, right? So so. Um, so back to kind of the frequency of this, it is relatively, it's probably relatively infrequent um, that um, these kinds of soft error bit flips occur. So assuming that if you do a detect one, there was only a single bit that got flipped, um, you're going to be right most of the time that, that that was the case, right? So, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you read into our, further into our textbook, um, apparently most, um, uh, semiconductor chip manufacturing use a single error correction, but double error detecting code. So um, uh, the, the scheme that we talked about using the Hamming distance here um, shows the ability to just detect a single bit flip um, error, but by just adding one more extra bit, you can actually still do the single error correction, single bit error correction, but you can, you can detect cases where two bits actually got flipped. So. Um, somebody was actually asking about um, check uh, checksum. If if um, the you may have heard of hashing things for cryptography like SHA two five six and and others. Uh, I mean hashes are a kind of checksum. So yeah, so so it's 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 a uh, 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 same kind of idea going on here. So the the general idea of a checksum is to do some sort of a calculation that maybe um, uh, results in a. Uh, a single sum, a single result. Um, so, so no, no matter how big, for, for cryptography, you're usually usually doing a hash, so that no matter how big the the um, the input is, the, the the message that you wanted to do a, a checksum on, you come out with one like a two fifty six bit number that, that that's the hash result of that thing. But um, the process is similar that we're talking about here when you're using this kind of checksum for error correction. So. So yeah, I didn't describe all those, uh, but again, yeah, you can maybe check out Wikipedia if you want to see some other ideas besides Hamming codes that, that people use for kind of error correcting codes and these kinds of communication um, or memory storage in this case, um, applications here, so. Um, Okay, so yeah, like I said, I, I, um, I mean, I, th I think it would be good if you if uh, that uh, you work through this example on your own, um, make certain that you understand it. I'll try and work through it a bit quickly, but um, um, I'm not certain um, how clear it can be talking about it for five or ten minutes here. Um, the um, Hamming code. Um, is an example, uh, or, or in this case, this is an example of, of where we're going to be using it both for error detection and error correction. So um, it works by basically um, calculating um, this syndrome word, uh, which is really uh, um, 
calculating some parity bits like we talked about, uh, like I kind of talked about, or in a similar way. So basically we're going to be grouping together bits in our original data in some way, like uh, like like this, um, and and calculating a parity bit for different groups of the uh, data digits, right? Um, and then if you do that right, um, you'll end up uh, in, when you calculate this syndrome, which is just a collection of these parity bits, you'll end up um, that the, the resulting syndrome, syndrome word will not only detect, be able to detect whether there's an error or not, but from the value of the syndrome word, it will tell you which bit, if you assume that there was a single bit error, you know, which bit it was that, that was incorrect. Um, that you could then correct um, to, to what the, the value should have been um, from this code. So, um, so um, I mean, basically, if you didn't understand uh, this here, so so, um, where was that? Sorry. Um, yeah, this here. So, what what this is saying is this this allows you to figure out how many extra bits you need in order to do this Hamming code um, and and cal calculate the syndrome word. So basically, the idea is that um, so since if, if I have k bits, um, I can represent values in the range from uh, you know, so with k bits, you can represent two to the k unique different values, right? Um, so to use this as for this the syndrome, uh, we're going to use the, the value zero to indicate that no error was detected. And we want all the other 2k minus one values to indicate if there's an error, and then also be able to use that to detect which bit there was an error in, okay? So what that means then, uh, if you compare that 2K minus one to M is the number of number of bits in the word that you're trying to create your Hamming code, um, you know, check syndrome for. Um, uh, so, so to be able to detect whether the, the error was in one of those M bits, or you, you can also with this detect it, that it was actually in one of the, the K syndrome check bits, okay? So M plus K is the number of bits um, in total that you would need to store a word of size M and then K syndrome check bits here. Okay, that's where the M plus K comes from. And so uh, if, if I need a code that can detect, that, that can specify which one of these M or which one of these K um, is the bit that was, uh, that had a soft error, I need to, um, um, I need at least two to the power of K, whatever, whatever K is the number of bits in my syndrome minus one. Right, so that that inequality holds, and if you didn't quite follow that, that's fine. But but what that means is you can use that to say, if if I want to have, um, if I want to use this Hamming code for um, an eight bit word, um, if I use three check bits, I've, I've got eleven bits total. But um, with with three K with three uh, syndrome check bits. I can only represent seven different values. That's not enough to specify which of these eight plus 11 plus three, which is 11 bits, was the one that was the error, right? But if I use four check bits for, for my syndrome, um, I've got 12 bits in total, the, the eight bits plus my four check bits, but two to the four means I've got, I can specify 16 different possibilities. So, so you know, I've got more than, a little bit more than enough to specify which of these eight or four bits it was that was actually in the error there, okay? So, so basically you can use four check bits for up to um, eight, nine, 10, 11. So, so for words up to a size 11, um, uh, that, that would be 15 bits total, uh, and I could use four check bits for that. Once I have a, a word size of 12, I need to use five, you know, a K of five for that, and so on. Uh, 
Um, and then you can figure out this, this scheme here, so if I remember the, the details of it. So, so again, if you understand the, the way these check bits work, so, so C1, C2, C3, C4 are the, the parity uh, check bit that we're going to calculate. So somehow you have to group together um, some number of the data digits that you're, that you're trading your, your, your parity bit for, right? Um, and in this case, you know, for, for an 8-bit word, we've got more, um, more range than we need. So some of these carry bits, we just um, have to have a group of five, like for the, the, or sorry, the check bits, we have to have a group of five, but some of these, uh, then we only need four, right? Um, So they, if you want to figure out this scheme, the, the, the book describes it. So, so first of all, um, um, for this the syndrome checksum that's, that's calculated, uh, we use all of the powers of two are going to be for the check bits, um, for, for our uh, check carry bits, uh, um, um, parity bits, right? So, um, so that means that you know if 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 we end up with a syndrome of, of one here, uh, that means that the error was in the the it wasn't in the actual data. It was in the um, the, the the check one bit here, and 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 so we use one, two, four, and eight, right? So so for for um, for k is four, having four carry bits, which is enough for an eight eight bit word. Um, the the positions that indicate that there was an error in the actual check bit are at one, two, four, and eight. And then these other positions, um, if we end up with our result, are, are, are going to indicate which digit the error was at. Um, digit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of our data here, right? Um, And this works out. Um, so, for example, like, like if you want to figure out why it is that we do the exclusive OR of these particular five digits for the C1 bit, basically you have to go through and look at all the digits um, on the, their position number that have a one in the ones place. So, so we're going to do an exclusive OR of digit one, uh, digit um, two, digit four, um, digit four five and digit seven. Yeah, so that was right. And if you want to know which 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 digits you're going to exclusive or together for your check bit, your parity bit, um, for the, the check bit two, um, it's the ones where the one is in the, 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 the second position, right? So that's, again, digit one, but um, digit three, uh, digit four, and digit six and digit seven. Right? And again, the reason why we do that in this way is because so so if, if you calculate um, you know so so if you wanted to store the the example data like they showed here so so here the example data was um, that we originally store was. You, know, you have to look at the the digits. It was zero zero one 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 zero zero one, right? Skip over the check bits, the, the actual digits, and then from that uh, you use the uh, you know you cap calculate these parities, and that will give you the uh, the 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 check bits here, the check bit one two four and eight. And again, you know this is, this is an exclusive or, but another way of thinking about that is. That's just the bit to make certain that um, um, for the group that we selected, um, that we end up with an even number of ones. Um, so the same thing happens whether you think of that as doing an exclusive or, or as grouping them somehow and making certain that we have an even number of, of ones. Uh, we get that, right? <laughs> And then, you know, if you do the same calculation when you fetch the word out and you recalculate your check bits, um, and then if, if you um, 
basically, if you just do an exclusive or of the original check bits as stored with the, the new set of check bits, you'll get a resulting syndrome word that, that they call it. And then this though, because of arranging these things correctly, tells you exactly, you know, if this is zero, then no error occurred. But if this is non-zero, this is gonna tell you the position of the bit that was flipped. So position 0110 flip. So if we look at that, um, that was this bit here. So we originally had stored the bit um, as a zero, um, but when we fetched it back out, it was a one. That, that was the only one that flipped, right? Okay, and I hope that that kind of made sense um, or that that's enough, you know, you really should kind of go back and, and make certain that you can follow kind of that example of how it works. So it, it, it's clever, um, um, these, these kinds of Hamming codes when you get into the details of, of how they work and, and things. So you can, you can continue extending that the scheme out so you could correct for two errors or, or more, you just have to add more, um, check bits and things, um, but um, but it is possible. So. And um, yeah, as, as I already mentioned, um, um, because it only adds one extra bit, um, apparently it's pretty common to use uh, not what we just described, which was single error correcting um, code, but to use a single error correcting, but double error detecting, right? So um, um, as I showed in this um, table, or was it? Yeah, so um, for zero, single error correcting, that's the number of tech bits you need uh, for each number of data bits, word size, and you only need just one extra bit to make it into a double error correcting code, so. But, but yeah, this is kind of a big thing here. So um, as they as they point out, so normally um, uh, if you do this, um, like on on, eight, if you do the Hamming code on like just an eight bit word, um, that is increasing your memory by quite a bit, over fifty percent. So most of these error correcting uh, work. Um, um, mechanisms work somewhere down here so that the overhead is only like, uh, I think they said like five to 20% or so, which which implies that they're usually doing it more like 32 to 128 bits um, um, for the, uh, the, the code that they store and uh, check on here. Um, All right, um, I know that's kind of kind of quick. Anybody um, want to ask a question on that or go back over anything on the Hamming codes? All right. Um, If not, then um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot more. So uh, I mean, the last three sections we're just looking at some um, newer um, technology developments in this space for for implementing uh, different kinds of semiconductor memory, right? So yeah, again, as I've already mentioned, this is um, a lot of this stuff is all relatively recent. In fact, um, I've been looking around. I'm not certain. I mean, this this uh, DDR dynamic um, uh, the 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 synchronous DRAM SDRAM and then the double data rate, rate SDRAM sounds interesting. I'm not certain um, if it's being used um, commonly in lots of systems or not. I've been kind of looking around for it, but um, um, just real quickly, I mean, this 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 particular one, from my understanding of reading about this, uh, I mean, this, this is really just a uh, dynamic RAM, 
So, so we already talked about dynamic RAM. So this is the simpler one that, that was using just like a, a single capacitor and it's charged to represent a bit. Um, so mainly used for main memory instead of the faster cache, right? But basically, uh, so, you, so you can think of, of DRAM as it's been used kind of until this, this new, um, um, this new development for synchronous RAM as, as asynchronous RAM. So basically the, the way you would read or write data to um, DRAM that's not synchronous, um, you know, you'd have to put the stuff out onto your bus in terms of, you know, your control code and things. Um, but then you would basically have to uh, wait um, for um, a resulting signal um, from the asynchronous DRAM that um, it's settled down enough and it's safe to either do the next write or to read the, the data out now that, that you ask it to read from. So, so you know, the, the main thing, and again, I'm not a hardware guy or electrical engineering guy, but um, um, by basically driving the, the DRAM with a regular synchronized clock instead of doing it asynchronously, um, I mean, it sounds like from this description that you can um, make it approach, I mean, at least whatever your bus speed is, right? So, so you can synchronize it to the, your bus speed. Um, which is kind of faster than, than what you're really able to do with, with asynchronous DRAM up to this point. So, um, and yeah, I don't know if in theory, if you can try and push that down so that you can actually get the, uh, the, the speed to like um, typical uh, processor kinds mm -hmm. of, of access speeds or not, but um, Uh, but anyway, I mean, and there's there's more than one thing about this. So besides uh, driving it with a regular clock that you synchronize to, um, uh, the, I mean, they've also been pushing the, the 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 clock rate on the bus. So usually your your data rate on your on your bus runs at at a different speed than your clock rate on your processor semiconductor chip. So I mean, if you push those up so that they approach the the same um, speeds. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about this when we talked about buses, you know, so there's problems with trying to um, increase that, uh, especially uh, when we were talking about um, 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 kind of uh, the, the, the standard sorts of old style buses rather than the newer ones. So, um, Yeah, and anyway, and, and also some other things. So some buffering schemes used. So in order to make the synchronization um, uh, possible, uh, you have to do a little bit of buffering, I guess, before you start sending out your data. So, so um, yeah, and and, and the, the 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 big difference on the the double data rate was basically being able to push it to use um, uh, responses both on the up and the down cycle of the clock, right? So instead of waiting every time for the up cycle to do the next thing, the, the double data rate does something when it goes up and then down, you know, effectively doubling the rate. So, um, uh, so potentially being able to, to get even more Kind of speed out of this. So. The DDR4 seems to be pretty popular with a lot of the laptops um, sales lately, from what I've seen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, HP and Levino, they, they have them in uh, their laptop. So. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, if, if people are talking about that uh, in systems, you know, so that's what that is. That, that's this um, um, newer variation on um, on your dynamic RAMs here, the synchronized versions of them. Um, um, and then flash memory. So we already mentioned this a little bit, um, um, kind of a, 
a newer thing. So yeah, I mean, to me, my understanding of it is it's kind of like the EEPROM, um, uh, but, but just a slightly different technology, but it has some similar characteristics. So one, one of the, the limitations of flash drives that, that you may or may not know about is, is they are, um, 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 they, they, um, they, they do have some upper limitations on how often you can write to them. The, the, so-called this flashing process is, is talked there. So, you know, if, if you use them lots, they can wear out um, and start failing. So, um, and, uh, you know, solid state dri drives um, are kind of similar, um, uh, and some similar sa or same kind of technology, so. Um, that's what they're using for memory in the phones nowadays, aren't they? Yeah. So, I mean, this stuff's being used in a lot of places like that, like smartphones and, and uh, kind of newer sorts of. Um, it was driving me nuts when I walked into the store and they were saying ROM for how much internal memory. And I'm like, why are they calling it ROM? That doesn't make sense. But now I understand because they're using that te technology, but it's so far removed from read only memory in the way it traditionally has been in the past that you would think they come up with a kind of a newer name to reflect that better flash memory works better but they don't call it that in the stores on those little cards yeah <laughs> yeah. So. yeah um yeah and um you know so i don't know all the details of these but yeah so apparently there's kind of two different ones so the, the one for flash cards is the um um for like uh flash drives, um, uh, is, is the NAND type apparently. So, um, because of the, the difference of this technology, um, it, it's, uh, the, the NAND type of the flash is more suitable for writes at like block levels. So that makes it more like what we think of as external memory devices. So thus we kind of use that for, um, uh, your flash drives and maybe your external um, um, SD cards and things like that. So, uh, whereas the NOR um, is better at like a byte by byte read. So, so you might be seeing that to be the stuff uh, being used in um, like your main memory, but on like maybe phone devices or things like that. So, uh, So then, yeah, I mean, the, this kind of figure 518 in the very last section is kind of redrawing our memory hierarchy again, um, but um, kind of plugging in some of these newer things in here, so where they fall on the price performance capacity um, sort of spectrum. So again, you know, to me, um, I mean, unless you are going to be a hardware guy, you know, kind of knowing the details of, 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 of how the technology works is interesting, but, 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 you know, kind of what, what it comes down to is, is, you know, what you really need to know to compare these things is where they fall into the, the, the current hierarchy on the price performance sort of spectrums, you know, so, so this is a useful diagram for kind of orienting yourself to these different variations that are coming along. So we used to have just SRAM and DRAM. Um, now our solid state, devices, um, I believe, are, are mostly based on like NAND flash um, um, types of things. And de definitely flash drives kind of as the name suggests. Um, and, and so we might see some of these others that are mentioned here, the static RAM, um, or sorry, the, um, the, the STT RAM, um, PC RAM, and the RE RAM because um, they have slightly different properties. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, our, our textbook didn't make a, a big deal of it, but, uh, but yeah, the spin transfer torque is kind of interesting to me that it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's actually non-volatile. So if you slot it in here for your DRAM or SRAM, but that non-volatile nature, so if it has the same price performance um, as like uh, SRAM and DRAM, but it's not volatile, um, um, uh, that, that's, that's an interesting um, mix to me, right? Because now all of a sudden you have something that, that, that's permanent storage like hard drive, 
uh, but uh, is as fast as your cash um, technologies, maybe, or in that range anyway. So. so this stuff might make even better um, what what we call solid state drives. You know, so again, that would that would be an excellent solid state drive because. You know, it's 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 performance wise as fast as, as Graham. Although, yeah, I mean, this is more expensive, so maybe it'd be too expensive um, uh, still um, on the current market to be using that for big um, solid state drives, I suppose. Um, um, all right. So, yeah, I think um, I'll go ahead and stop there. Is there anybody want to? Ask some questions or discuss anything. So that article they were the DRAM for AI, they're not talking about actually putting it right on the top of the, the processor chip, right? Right, so, yeah. That was interesting. Uh, um yeah, so so yeah, I mean just from that kind of short description of it, it um, uh, because uh, because of how you could lay down the, the memory that would uh, actually, and I've heard I've heard other things, I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but but yeah, being able to, so most chip fabrication is, is just two dimensional. So it's all laid down in a plane. So so yeah, I mean, if you use that third dimension, um, that gives you a lot more room that you could pack in, you know, your, your components. Um, plus it also allows you to do interesting things in shortening the distances between components and stuff. So, so yeah, I think that was part of what this this thing was talking about. That that because uh, you could lay it out maybe on top uh, of other things, uh, among other things on this. So. It's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned in this, I mean, we are in an interesting time now to be in computing, you know, so because we're hitting these bottlenecks on Moore's law um, and other things, uh, you are probably going to be living through the next five or 10 years of some explosion in variety of architectures and processing elements and things like that. So, um, you know, things were a lot more uniform um, in the 90s or so. Um, everything was being driven by increases in Moore's law, you know, so, so things will be more complex in terms of systems and being able to compare them and look at the trade-offs and stuff. So. All right, so yeah, looking ahead. So we'll do external memory. So basically drives, um, talk a little bit about RAID next week. So it'll be interesting. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess I'll say, you know, have a good night, uh, stay safe. So we got some weather coming in. Um, yeah. Um, the quiz for the feedback isn't working yet. Did you? Uh, Okay, I'll check it. Yeah, I thought it should have been up, but uh, but yeah, maybe it's um, maybe it's not. I'm not able to get it, so. Okay, uh, I'll check here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then also I wanted to know for tomorrow, are we meeting? Oh, um, uh, you, maybe I have to send you an email. Something might come up here, so um, I wasn't okay. certain yet. So. Okay, we'll play it by ear then. Okay. Thank you. All right. Everybody have a good night. I'll see you guys later. See you next I'll week. See you later. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thanks.